Now a hearing on the threat of wildfires in America's national forests. Yesterday, a House Resources Subcommittee reviewed a report on the subject issued by the General Accounting Office and heard testimony from GAO and U.S. Forest Service officials. Idaho Representative Helen Chenoweth chaired the two-hour meeting. The uh, Subcommittee on Forest and Forest Health will come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on the GAO report entitled, A Cohesive Strategy is Needed to Address Catastrophic Wildfire Threats, end quote. Under Rule 4G of the Committee Rules, any oral opening statement at, uh, at hearings are limited to the Chairman and the Ranking Minority Member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, if other members have statements, they can be included in the hearing record under unanimous consent. We are here today to discuss the recently released General Accounting Office report entitled, A Cohesive Strategy is Needed to Address Catastrophic Wildfire Threats. Of the 191 million acres managed by the Forest Service, 70% are located in the dry interior western United States. And according to the Forest Service, 39 million of these acres are at an abnormally high risk of catastrophic fire. The GAO calls the region a tinderbox. The problem is an overaccumulation of vegetation that can turn to what would otherwise be a low intensity fire, which in most instances would not hurt larger native trees, but turn it into a blazing catastrophic fire that destroys everything in its path. The question is, will the Forest Service be able to reduce excessive fuels accumulation on national forest lands in a timely and responsible manner? I have serious doubts because of the points raised by GAO in this report. There is a major disconnect between Forest Service rhetoric and its actions. And sadly, what's at stake are the lives of local residents and firefighters, the environmental health of our national forests, and the protection of adjacent state and private forests and property, and the economic well-being of local communities. Not only do I look forward to hearing the GAO discussion on this report, but I look forward to hearing exactly how the Forest Service intend to act, act on this critical issue. With that, I would like to welcome Mr. Barry Hill, the Associate Director for Energy Resources and Science Issues with the GAO for his testimony. And um, I would ask that Mr. Hill uh, come to the witness table. Mr. Hill will be accompanied by Mr. Chet Joy, who is the Senior Evaluator, Natural Resource Management Issues, Mr. Charles Cotton, Assistant Director, Resources Community and Economic Development, and, um, all right. And uh, under, I would like for, under unanimous consent, to ask if there are any other opening remarks. I see Mr. Herger has joined the, um, the subcommittee. Um, do you have any opening remarks, Mr. Herger? Uh, I do, Madam Chair. You are recognized for your thank remarks. Thank you. Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I thank you for arranging this hearing today on an issue of such great importance. The danger of wildfires is particularly severe in forests in western United States. I personally have all or parts of 11 national forests in my northern California district okay. and am gravely concerned about this impending threat. Unlike other forests, in other parts of the country, forests in the West suffer from unusually high incidence of fire. Historically, the forest floors were less dense and were naturally and regularly thinned by lightning and native-caused fires that would clean out dense underbrush, allowing large trees to grow even larger. However, because of decades of well-meaning, 
but aggressive fire suppression practices, these forests have grown out of hand, creating an almost overwhelming threat of catastrophic fire. In some areas, our national forests are two to three times denser than they were in 1928. Thick undergrowth combined with increasingly taller layers of intermediate trees has turned western forests into deadly fire time bombs. Now when a fire starts, it quickly climbs up the dense tree growth like a ladder until it tops out at the uppermost or crown level of the forest and races out of control as a catastrophic fire. Because of their high speed and intense heat, crown fires are nothing like the normally healthy fires of the past, but have the capability of leaving an almost sterile environment in their wake with almost no vegetation, wildlife, or habitat left behind. Unfortunately, the Forest Service has failed to address this critical threat. The following account provides a troubling example of the Forest Service's failure to take action. In Northern California in the summer of 1996, at a time when uncommonly severe storms resulted in massive tree blowdowns, which further exacerbated the threat of catastrophic wildfires, the Clinton-Gore administration directed a completely hands-off approach to these areas of extreme fire danger. This management ban occurred despite the almost desperate pleas of a local forest supervisor who was begging for the authority to act, emphatically informing her superiors that the hands-off mandate was unworkable and dangerous and would result in catastrophic fire. Yet, the Washington office only allowed her limited access to the areas she wished to enter to remove massive amounts of downed material. This material, once removed, would have greatly reduced the fire risk and could have also generated a net profit to the U.S. Treasury and the local communities as a salvage timber sale. Thus, a potential win-win by inaction turned into a lose-lose. The Quincy Library Group legislation, which I authored and which passed the Congress overwhelmingly last year, provides, I believe, a win-win solution for our communities and a model for responsible Forest Service management. The QLG legislation mandates two specific resource management activities that would significantly reduce the risk of catastrophic fire while also providing the economic well-being of local communities. The success of the QLG plan would prove that forest health and economic stability are not mutually exclusive. And it would prove that for forest management to be successful, local collaboration must take precedence over Washington-based directives. The threat of wildfire discussed here today is not irreversible. Using the QLG as a model, the Forest Service can take proactive steps to improve forest health on all our western national forests through an aggressive policy that focuses on all western national forests through an aggressive policy that focuses on thinning out of smaller trees and dense underbrush to restore our forests to their historic healthy conditions. Regrettably, however, because of a top-down, Washington-based approach to forest management that has virtually paralyzed the Forest Service, this necessary policy is not being implemented. In the meantime, forest health deteriorates rapidly. The threat of catastrophic fire looms, and our communities suffer economically. Madam Chairman, each national forest is unique. And it is unacceptable for the administration to assume that it can manage this emergency situation better from Washington than the local foresters can from their own local areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herger. And now uh, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Adam Smith for any opening remarks. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank you for bringing this important subject before us uh, to the subcommittee. Look forward to the testimony from the witnesses. I guess what I am most interested in in this area, this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time, is the need um, to thin out areas for fire protection, um, also uh, a bug infestation and other concerns that are threatening the forest health. There seems to be an incredibly wide gap, however, um, between uh, people's views on what this sort of thinning means, um, how extensive it is, and there is wide suspicion on behalf of the environmental community that the thinning is primarily aimed at resource extraction, um, and there's images back to the salvage rider and concerns about that. Um, I guess in my, in my work in politics, I've never seen such a divergent opinion on such an issue that seems to me like we ought to be able to reach some sort of consensus on it. Um, and what I'm most interested in hearing from the witnesses is, you know, how can we arrive at that consensus? And if we're talking about thinning out underbrush, I actually haven't gone out and looked at, at this, although I am going out this August to look at some forests um, back in my home state to get a look at the problem and understand it. Um, what exactly are we talking about in term, you know, how much is going to be cleaned out? What does this have to do with cutting down trees, if we're just talking about cleaning out underbrush, and is there some way that we can bridge a gap um, between the folks who tend to be on, well, I mean, if you go back to the traditional battlefront of the, the timber companies and um, loggers on one side, environmentalists on the other, there's this wide gap in there where the timber companies say, gosh, we have to do this thinning for forest health, um, and the environmentalists say that's just a ruse to cut down more trees. Um, they don't, in my experience in talking with them, deny that there is a problem. Um, with the underbrush and that thinning could be part of it, but their alternative argument is, fine, let's, let's focus on forest health as the preeminent issue and forget about resource extraction um, and just talk about what do we need to do to make the forest healthy. So if you gentlemen and, and anyone else who testifies could help me you know, bridge that gap, that is what I am most interested in because what is undeniable is that we do have a problem in terms of forest health in this country, and I would like to go past, uh, get past the arguments um, over what to do about that and get to doing something about it. So that's what I'd be interested in hearing from, and I thank the chair for the opportunity. I thank uh, my ranking minority member for his statement. Um, we're only going to have one panel today, and so I would like to call uh, Ms. Janice McDougal, McDougal up to join the um, witness table. Uh, Ms. McDougal is the deputy chief of state and private forestry with U.S. Forest Service here in Washington. And uh, she's accompanied by Mr. Denny Truesdale, Assistant Director of Fire and Aviation Management. Welcome. As explained in our first hearing, it is the intention of the chairman to place all witnesses under the oath. It is a formality of the committee that is meant to assure open and honest discussion and should not affect the testimony given by the witnesses. I believe all of the witnesses were informed of this before the hearing and uh, that they have each been provided a copy of the committee rules. And so if all five of you would please stand and raise your right arm to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. <laughs> And now we recognize Mr. Barry Hill for his testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, as always, it's a great pleasure to appear before this subcommittee. Uh, we're here today to discuss the status of efforts by the Forest Service to develop a cohesive strategy to reduce the threat of catastrophic wildfires on national forests in the interior west. And if I may, I'd like to briefly summarize my prepared statement and uh, submit the full text of the statement for the record. Without objection, so ordered. As you well know, in April, we did report that many national forests in the interior west, as well as nearby communities, are increasingly threatened by large catastrophic wildfires caused by the excessive accumulation of vegetation that forms fuels for such fires. The uh, chart to my right here uh, shows the forests in the interior west that we are talking about. The Forest Service has agreed to develop a cohesive strategy for reducing these fuels and formally communicate the strategy to the Congress together with estimates of the cost to implement it. According to the agency, it intends to develop a strategy by the end of this year. Developing and implementing a fuels reduction strategy presents a difficult challenge to the Forest Service. 
We estimate that the cost of the agency to reduce fuels on the 39 million acres of national forest land in the interior west could be as much as $725 million annually. That's more than 10 times the current funding level. Such a strategy also transcends the boundaries of both the Forest Service's field and program structures. For example, the 155 national forests are the agency's basic planning units, and each forest has considerable autonomy and discretion in interpreting and applying the agency's policies and directions. However, a strategy to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire in the region will need to transcend the boundaries of individual forests and involve most, if not all, of the 91 national forests located in the interior west. Similarly, a strategy to reduce fuels must include all three of the Forest Service's major organizational areas, the national forest system, the state and private forestry programs, and the research and development arm of the agency. Within the national forest system, such a strategy will need to draw funds and staff from many of the agency's nine resource-specific programs, including those responsible for timber, wildlife and fish, recreation, and water and air quality. Forest Service field staff told us that it is often difficult to undertake needed fuel reduction efforts because the agency's areas and programs all, uh, often have different goals, objectives, and funding sources, use different criteria to allocate funds to the field offices, and are not adequately, adequately coordinated to focus on overarching priorities such as fuel reduction. Confronted with other issues that trans transcend its field and program structures, the Forest Service has on occasion shown that it can develop and implement a cohesive strategy. For example, together with uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service developed and is implementing a regional land management strategy in the Pacific Northwest called the Northwest Forest Plan. The plan provides management direction for 22.3 million acres of land managed by the two agencies, including 19 national forests and seven BLM districts in the range of the threatened northern spotted owl. The agencies completed the plan expeditiously and at a relatively low cost compared with past national forest planning efforts. Other agency-wide issues, however, have languished for years as the Forest Service has undertaken study after study without ever developing a strategy or has developed a strategy but left its implementation to the discretion of its independent and autonomous regional offices and forests with mixed results. At the Forest Service, a key element that separates the strategies that are effectively implemented from those that are not is whether the agency treats the issue as an agency-wide priority. For example, improving the condition of the agency's road system is clearly a high priority. To accomplish this, the Forest Service has identified the issue as a funding priority in its fiscal year 2000 budget justification, has requested an additional $22.6 million for maintaining and decommissioning roads during fiscal year 2000, has proposed a new appropriation for next fiscal year that includes monies for reconstruction and maintaining roads, and has linked the issue to the goals and objectives in its strategic plan. In comparison, reducing the growing threat of catastrophic wildfires is not emphasized in the agency's strategic plan. In addition, only one of the Forest Service's three major organizational areas with responsibility for reducing fuels, the state and private forestry programs, has been tasked with developing such a strategy. In addition, even though the agency said that it would need an additional $37 million in fiscal year 2000 to increase the number of acres treated, the agency did not request any additional funds and will therefore treat about 60,000 fewer acres next year than it will treat this year. Madam Chairman, we recognize that the Forest Service has just begun to develop a fuel reduction strategy and that priorities can and do change. If reducing the threat of catastrophic wildfires does become a priority, then we would expect it to be reflected in three documents that the agency will issue over the next eight months. First, we would expect it to appear in the agency's update of its strategic plan as an objective or outcome, or at least be linked to the plan's goals and objectives. Second, the strategy being developed would provide the agency's land managers with adequate direction for implementation and set standards for holding them accountable, rather than merely providing broad general objectives and direction that cannot be quantified or measured. Finally, and probably most telling of all, 
if fuel reduction is accorded a high priority, then we would expect the agency to identify the strategy as a special project for funding in fiscal year 2001 and to withhold funds from the regions and forest budgets to develop and implement the strategy before funds are allocated to resource-specific programs. Madam Chairman, this concludes my statement. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. The Chair now recognizes Ms. McDougall for her testimony. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I would like to briefly summarize my testimony and submit the full testimony for the record. But let me say at the outset, we agree with the assessment of GAO. The Forest Service is committed to the health of ecosystems we manage and the health and safety of our wildlands and rural neighbors. And I'd also like to say that we're actively engaged in developing a strategy to address this complex issue. The General Accounting Office accurately reports that many forest ecosystems have changed structurally over the last 100 years to a point where they are now at high risk of catastrophic fire. The federal fire suppression policy for the last 100 years has had an unintended consequence. In addition to protecting forests from fires, it has profoundly influenced the composition, structure, and function of ecosystems where frequent and low intensity fires historically occurred. Over time, other values have taken on added impo importance. Americans today want to protect resources and habitat for federally listed threatened endangered species, protect air quality, especially near urbanized areas of the country, and allocate land to wilderness and other special designations. These values provide challenges to putting fire back into the ecosystem because most methods of reducing fuels are difficult to reconcile with them. In addition to changes in forest conditions, an increasing number of people are moving from urban areas to rural areas near public lands, which has resulted in more homes and businesses near national forests. This mix of people, property, and forests is commonly called wildland urban interface. Structures in these areas are extremely vulnerable should wildfire occur. Increased population in the rural and forest environment, coupled with the increased hazards from fuels accumulation, has increased the risk of fire threat to life and property. The Forest Service anticipates completing a cohesive strategy by the end of 1999. The fire management staff is leading an interdisciplinary team composed of specialists in fire, forest health, forest management, watershed, fire research, and wildlife and fish management to develop this strategy. The strategy will include the use of many management tools available to us timber sales where appropriate, thinning of timber stands, watershed improvement projects, wildlife habitat treatment, as well as prescribed fire and mechanical treatment. In terms of collecting better data and developing measurable goals, I am happy to report great progress on our risk mapping effort. I testified before this subcommittee in the fall of 98. The Forest Service had established an interdisciplinary team to coordinate our efforts to define and map risks so that we will have better information to prioritize our fuel reduction work. The Forest Service is currently developing a strategic plan, annual performance plan, as directed by the Government Performance and Results Act. We are also in the process of developing both strategic plan objectives as well as annual performance plan indicators for fuel treatment. Areas in need of high-risk fuel reduction do not always coincide with areas of highest priority for forest health, watershed restoration, and protection, 
or timber production, it is not always possible for the two to combine into a cohesive program that provides the optimum fuel treatment. The GAO accurately reports that the high cost of treating fuels as a, is a significant barrier, and we're confident that by identifying prioritized strategic treatment areas, we may significantly reduce the total number of acres that the Forest Service will need to treat. In closing, Madam Chairman, clearly we face great challenges in improving forest health and reducing high fire risk. However, the Forest Service in 1998 treated nearly 1.5 million acres for fuels reduction. By the year 2005, the goal is to treat at least 3 million acres per year. Involved, I would like a commitment from you today that coal barachia will be reinstated and that you will do whatever you can to prevent anything like this from happening in the future. Uh, Madam Chairman, we were just made aware of this about Boise Hotshot firefighting crew. Um, I brought this matter before this subcommittee and the Forest Service subsequently reinstated the Boise Hotshot, much to your credit. Yesterday I learned fortunately that this final chapter involving charges uh, against Mr. Cole Barachia of Boise, who was the leader of the Boise Hotshots, were finally dropped. Um, he was the supervisor of the Boise Hotshot crew and they were dropped after 16 months of administrative leave and countless sleepless nights as he was waiting for a thoughtless bureaucracy to decide his fate. Uh, but I would like some, um, I would like to know um, what your thoughts are on this and I would like some assurance from you, Ms. McDougall, and from you, Mr. Truesdale, that the Forest Service will deal with any future personnel problems in a manner more respective of justice and with more care to the people involved and to the communities that rely on these essential firefighting crews, such as we were just involved in um, last week in, in our hearings in Florida in which the Boise firefighting crews were involved. I would like a commitment from you today that Cole Barachia will be reinstated and that you will do whatever you can to prevent anything like this from happening in the future. Uh, Madam Chairman, we were just made aware of this about two minutes before this hearing by your staff and we had not been informed that this had happened at all. Um, I take it that you mean this being that the charges had been yes. dropped. Um, knowing that the charges have been dropped, I would like to, um, I would like to know uh, that Cole Barachia, who is such a highly trained firefighter and a man I can attest to with great personal integrity, um, I think that the Boise Hotshots need his leadership again and certainly the, the Forest Service uh, has relied on, on this kind of firefighting crew. So I would like to know that they will be made whole again uh, with his joining the, the hotshots again. Madam Chairman, I'm a little reluctant to do that without consultation with the regional forester. Uh, we have not had an opportunity to visit about that, but if he's okay, I'm okay. All right, I appreciate the fact, Ms. McDougall, that you will pursue that. And yes. Mr. Truesdale, would you add anything to the record that you would like? with regards to this matter? Well, I agree that the Hotshot Crew Program is one of our, a significant part of our wildland firefighting effort. We have crews all over the country similar to the Boise crew and they've performed admirably throughout. We have reinstated the crew. The crew is up and functioning. I know that the efforts for the Boise National Forest and for the area for that crew are very important and we intend to maintain that program with the highest level of integrity and commitment to that as we can. So yes, we will maintain those crews and I assure you the commitment you had previously that the Boise crew would be there, it will be honored. And it is my hope that you will uh, lend your support to Ms. McDougall 
on the reinstatement of Colbert-Chia. Yes, we will look into that and, and get back with you with that. Yes. Um, can I expect a report from you within the next 24 hours? Yes, we can. Uh, a personnel matter is something that I'm not equipped at all to, to give you promises one way or the other, but within 24 hours, uh, we will talk to your staff about the, uh, what I have found out and what status there is. Yes, we will do that. That's good, Mr. Truesdale. I appreciate your keeping us posted on this very important issue to, to us in Idaho. Um, bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to well-intentioned programs, and this is our chance to uh, resolve this once and for all. I thank you very much. Um, I also want to say that I've been reading with interest Chief Dombeck's recent comments that the new top management priority for the Forest Service is clean water. I guess this shouldn't be much of a surprise considering that the chief has a fisheries and not a forestry background, but I also noticed that the number two position in the agency, that of the associate chief, was recently filled by a fishery scientist from the National Marine Fishery Service. Um, the agency has also in recent years uh, bought out or riffed more foresters than any other discipline in the Forest Service. I'm just wondering whether the name Forest Service is appropriate anymore. Maybe we should just call the Forest Service something else, such as a Park Service, and move it out of the Department of Agriculture and into the Department of Interior. I'd like for you to give me some reasons why we shouldn't move the agency into the Department of Interior, since we seem to have changed our focus. Madam Chairman, you put me in an awkward position because I'm not in the room when those decisions are made. I don't have the benefit of the thinking that goes into them. So, you know, if you want a reaction, uh, it's, it's, I'm not the one. Well, Ms. Dugo, I, I will be directing the question then to the chief. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will be returning with questions for um, Mr. Hill. Right now, I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Adam Smith for questions. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. I wonder if you'd help us out right at the start. When you talk about treating um, forest areas for fuels reduction purposes, what does that mean? I mean, what are the three or four, is there a list of, of treatments? There's four or five things. Mr. Hill, if you have an answer to this, you can throw that out there too. But if you could just, you know, chart for us, you look at, you see the problem, okay, this needs to be treated, you know, what are the tools that you have to select from at that point? I'm going to let Mr. Truesdale help here because he's, he's done it for many years, but, yep. you know, you have prescribed burning, uh, you have mechanical treatments, you have uh, timber harvest, there are a myriad of ways to treat, uh, treat an area. Okay, the mechanical treatments I could use further explanation on if Mr. Truesdale yeah, wants to. Yeah. The, uh, when I think of treatment, it's usually, well, it's either one of two things. One, it's a reduction in the amount of biomass or material that's out there, or it's a rearrangement of that material. And we tend to generically break it down into two ways. One, prescribed fire, which is fairly easy to understand, and then mechanical treatment lumps a whole range of things. It has been, it's such things as, as tractor, piling where you take bulldozers or some mechanical uh, piece of equipment and pile things up, knock it down. Right. It can be the timber sale treatments where you actually remove commercial or non-commercial material that can reduce the structure of the stand, a whole range of things. Hand piling, just having people out there uh, cutting brush with chainsaws and piling up uh, is very effective around the interface, for example, where uh, other types of treatment would be unacceptable aesthetically or politically. So it's a whole range of activities. And it, to what extent is, is commercial logging part of that? And I guess I asked that question because to a novice, I don't know a great deal about um, the forest that have just recently been put on the committee. Um, it seems to me like if you're talking about underbrush, right off the top, it occurs to me that how would much of that be commercially viable? Um, how would that be something that would even be of help? Um, to the logging industry if you're just talking about clearing stuff out because it could be a fire hazard? Logging in the sense that you're taking great big trees and out that can be turned into lumber 
uh, it may or may not be applicable because in many cases in fire adapted ecosystems such as ponderosa pine, those, the large ponderosa pine are uh, resistant to fire and it's what you would, the structure of the stand that you'd like to have left. But there's a whole range of things from small material, small diameter material from just chipping and biomass, uh, using the biomass if it's just brush, there may not be a market for the understory that's there, but it can be a wide range of things. Uh, in some ways, timber sale harvest, as was practiced 40 or 50 years ago, may have caused some problems by removing the big, large, easy to get trees and leaving the less desirable material. I think we've learned a lot in the last 50 years, and uh, commercial timber sales can be a very important part of it. It's not the full answer, though. You, there's so much stuff out there that right now doesn't all have commercial value. Mr. Hill, do you have some, something to add on that? or? No, I think the, the, the point that uh, Mr. Truesdale made at the end is a significant one. <clears throat> Much of what needs to be removed it does not have commercial value, and, and right now there's really no incentives in, in, in the contracting procedures that the Forest Service has to remove those, those, uh, those fuels. Right. Because I, I get the impression, and again, I come at this with just a, the old, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, I get the impression that you know, some of the old battles between environmentalists and logging companies are sort of getting in the way of you know moving forward with this policy, I guess first thing, am I right or wrong about that? Is that to what extent is that you know people concerned about too much salvage crossing over the line into commercial logging, or on the other hand, commercial loggers trying to use um, the excuse of salvage logging to grab um, more timber? To what extent has that hampered your ability to deal um, with the fuels problem, and uh, what could we do to get get past that? You're right, that's, that's a challenge of ours because of the trust factor, and that is what we think. Lack of trust factor, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. But, yeah. but, but we think that the, the risk maps that are being developed and refined and science-driven will help us um, to, to, with the credibility issue in terms of how we got to where we are what the priorities are, where, and then let the field-driven process, including public uh, participation, um, bear it out. So we think, we think and, and, and that's another thing I wanted to say about these maps, we want to get it right, and, and we want to make them credible, and then we want to use them. Okay. I wanted to ask about the science of it. And this is a point I kind of awkwardly made earlier. I've never encountered an issue where there was such diametric opposition on the basic facts. I mean, it's almost to me like I've got one side saying 2 plus 2 is 3 and the other side saying 2 plus 2 is 5 and they're sticking to their guns. Um, there, there is wide conflict on this science. I mean, this one person's science is somebody else's hack research. And are we making any progress on getting to the point where we can at least agree on the science? I mean, the nature of science is that it shouldn't be subjective. It shouldn't matter what your perspective is, how clear the science is, but you have to laugh when I make that statement because everybody who works on these issues knows that you know, the determining factor in what the science says is almost always where you're coming from. Um, is there any way to get around that? Any way to have, like, if there is such a thing in this area, an impartial scientist say this is the science and are we making any progress on that? Yes, we're, uh, in addition to the science, we're having uh, the information that they develop peer-reviewed and feel validated. And hence, that's what's taken us a little longer, so we can make them as credible as, as possible. But, but keep in mind, no one's ever done this before, and so this is new. And, and so, but I don't think that's a real issue, at least with what we're trying to do. Mr. Uh -huh. Smith? Go ahead. Um, I'd just like to uh, point out, in answer to whether or not there's been any changes, I think we, during the course of our review, did notice some changes or progress. Um, and that was in uh, an area of the country where there's been a lot of controversy and there's been the bitter division in which many environmental groups have said essentially cut nothing. The Forest Service has been relying in the Department of Interior on some, ad uh, on some advice in designing some fuels reduction, which suggested that about 85 to 90 percent of the trees in a given area be removed. Now, I want to emphasize 
That may sound like a lot, but when 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 uh, when 95 percent of the trees are as big as my finger, it, yeah. that doesn't make that much difference. In any event, the point is there were, had been absolute opposition before. More recently, the group that had been opposed to that had done some of their own test analyses, etc., and they decided that about 50 or 60 percent would be all right. Now, obviously, there's still a long way of difference between the two, and. The group is also concerned that even if there is, they co do come to an agreement on the numbers, that nonetheless nothing should be sold because that would create an incentive. Well, the point is if you can agree on a number and it's within the bounds, it shouldn't matter as long as there's a commitment not to go across that line. So, but nonetheless, that does reflect some progress. The narrowing of the difference between the 50 and the 90 or the whatever is, I think, what we also see as crucial uh, to be done, and that's something that the Forest Service's efforts really have to be directed at. Well, I, I would agree. I think few things are more important in solving this problem than making exactly the type of progress that you just described um, and making more of it. So, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Smith, the chair recognizes Mr. Duncan for questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. <coughs> Ms. McDougall, uh, at a hearing uh, earlier this year, we were told that uh, there is uh, roughly 23 billion board feet of growth in the national forests uh, each year, or, or now, and that we're, we're cutting approximately 3 billion board feet. Are those, those figures roughly accurate or roughly correct? What, what fiscal year are you talking about? This F by 99? Now, uh, yes. I, I don't know. <clears throat> and then we were also told that uh, that there's about uh, uh, six billion board feet of uh, dead or dying timber in the national forests. And, and in other words, we were told that it was about twice the amount that we were cutting. Is that uh, correct, or you don't know? Let you, me get back to your other question. At three billion is about right. The three billion is about yes. right. Yes. Yes. Now, in terms. Well, well, most most of these wildfires that we're talking about would. Uh, does a lot of that risk come from the dead and dying uh, uh, timber? Most fires are caused by lightning. Lightning. Mm -hmm. But I in terms of in <coughs> terms of trees that suffer um, w weakness, uh, yeah, it's a contributing factor. But most fires are caused by lightning. Is 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 uh, uh, d do you have any idea? I, n I know I read an article uh, uh, a few months ago in the Knoxville newspaper that uh, that Tennessee had roughly uh, 26 million acres total, and that approximately half of it was in forest. D do you have any idea, a uh, rough guess, as to how much of the land mass of the United States, what percentage is in forest? Is 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 50 percent? Uh, uh, is, is in Tennessee, is that fairly typical or, or uh, what does it range just out of curiosity? Can you make a rough, you, do you have a rough idea just? We don't have that information, you don't, you don't but we can that. provide it to you. Okay. Well, I do know that we have uh, approximately uh, 500 million acres of forested land that are not federal. 500 million? Nationwide. Nationwide. Uh, Mr. Hill, uh, you've estimated that uh, that, there, that it would cost approximately $12 billion over the next uh, a few years, or the GAO has, uh, to uh, take care of this wildfire problem. Is that correct? That is correct. But that uh, you're talking in that figure just about the interior west. Is that, is that also correct? You're not, that, that, that does not include Alaska and the... That is, that is the rest correct. of the country, the Midwest, the East, that, and so forth. That is correct. That is based on the 39 million acres uh, in the interior West. The, uh, the, right, the 39 million. I, I saw that figure. Do you, do you have any uh, uh, estimate as to how many million other acres, in, like in Alaska and the Midwest and the East and, and other parts of the country, are at risk? Would you have any idea of that? Um, Mr. Duncan, it would be substantially lower simply because in many places, particularly in the southeast, they've, they, the, they've been fairly well thinned and taken care of you know, over the past, largely through the efforts of the Forest Service. We're talking here only about Forest Service lands, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, other places generally don't have the climatic 
uh, and vegetative conditions to create these kinds of wildfires. There are a few small areas, but it's mainly the interior west, the gray portion there is the, is the problem. Well, uh, I noticed that, uh, uh, well, let me, let me also ask this. Uh, we, we've, uh, we're told that the, uh, that the Forest Service had a plan to uh, uh, start doing something about this or to really take care of this uh, uh, problem, that, a plan that was produced in, I think, 1994. Uh, what, uh, what's been done since that time? How far along are we with that, um, that plan? Are you asking me or? or yes, yes ma'am. We have um, done a lot of activities on the recommendations that were included in there and we would be happy to provide you a list of uh, how many were there, Denny, of the 94 plan? There were 39 recommendations and we have made substantial progress on them. So I will be happy to provide a list of uh, the status of those recommendations. Well. What, what I'm getting at, uh, according to a, a staff report that we have, it says uh, that in 94 you released a Western Forest Health Initiative in 1994, but that uh, in 95 you, you recommend increasing the number of acres treated annually to reduce uh, fuels, but you're not really uh, coming anywhere close to your own targets. Is that correct? Our targets to treat acres? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, last year we did, uh, some of the regions did even better than they were targeted to do. And we, we're still counting this year. Also, you've got, uh, uh, according to you, a maintenance backlog for uh, uh, roads of 7.3 to 8.3 billion. And uh, then we need uh, 12 billion to recover these uh, these wildfire threats. Yet uh, you've been able to request about 219 million in fiscal year 2000 for roads and 65 million for fuels reduction. Uh, if if we're coming uh, <coughs> that far short of what of the money that's needed, uh, is it not? Uh, uh, time for us to start thinking about the Forest Service divesting itself of some of this land if we really can't take care of it in the way it should be taken care of? I think that we have and are looking at many new ways of operating that's different from what we've traditionally done in order to maintain what we have. I, I think that the American people expect us to maintain it, expect us to take care of it, and we just have to seek different ways to do it, be it through partnerships, leveraging dollars, uh, or whatever. But it cannot be done the way it always has been done. We can no, no longer afford that. Well, I think <clears throat> that the American people do not realize, though, that we've got 23 billion board feet a year of growth, and we're only allowing 3 billion to be cut, and then we've got 6 billion dead and dying each year. And, and uh, if people want homes and books and toilet paper and all of those kinds of things, we're going to have to uh, allow a few more trees to be cut if we're going to keep anywhere close to the standard of living that we have now and the Forest Service could and should play an important part in that if it was being managed uh, uh, correctly and not by extremists. Uh, so at least that's, uh, I think that's an important point to get out. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Duncan, could I, could I make two points before we move on very quickly? Yes, sure. Um, it is true that lightning starts uh, many of the fires. The problem there is that it's the fuel buildup on the forest floor due to suppressing those fires in the past that then turns what have been a relatively healthy fire into a catastrophic fire that causes damage to both the resources and nearby communities. Uh, the second point is the fact that the Forest Service, even though it is moving toward a goal of treating three million acres a year, um, to meet their, their um, uh, effort to reduce the 39 million acres that need to be treated, they're actually going to treat, uh, what is it, 60,000 fewer acres this year than, 
than they treated last year. They're going to drop from roughly, um, you know, 1.4, 1.5 million down to 1.3. So to us, they're moving away from that goal, not toward it. That's an excellent point, and I thank Mr. Thank Duncan you. for bringing that up and, and uh, for you uh, uh, addressing it in more detail. In fact, the Forest Service chief has testified before this committee that there are 39 million acres uh, at catastrophic risk. Um, we have also had testimony that our forests are in a state of near collapse. Now, out of the 39 million acres, as you had mentioned, um, the Forest Service set a goal of, of uh, reducing fuels on 3 million acres, and they have only been able to accomplish that on less than 1 million acres. So th the American people are beginning to ask, what is, what is going on with, with the agency that they can't even reach less than one-tenth uh, of the acres that have been uh, determined by that agency themselves to be at high risk for catastrophic fire? So I thank you, Mr. Duncan, for bringing that point out, and uh, I look Chairman. forward with the new mapping priorities and and um, this new report to seeing a new direction in the Forest Service. Hopefully, Chair recognizes Mr. Doolittle. <coughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. McDougall, when uh, when did the Forest Service uh, determine that developing a comprehensive agency-wide strategy to combat uh, catastrophic forest fires would, would be one of its goals? The first one that we developed was the insect disease one uh, that shows the, across the United States how, uh, where we had the biggest problems in terms of mortality there. We're on our fourth iteration of that. We have been funded um, to work through our joint fire sciences program to do that, and that was one of the projects that we have identified. But my question was when did you make that determination? Go ahead. If I may, the plan that's being referenced today is developed based on those specific questions and specific criteria within the GAO report. So the okay, iteration... Okay, so the GAO report was the reason that you developed the uh, idea of having a strategic plan to combat forest fires, is that right? This, this particular one, the, the 19... I'd have to look at the dates, the course to the future, which outlined the 3 million acres, was probably done in 95, more or less. I don't know the date exactly. Okay. The, so at earlier iterations of the different plans have been, strategic plans have been in place for a while. And let's see, the GAO report was commissioned on what date? Mr. Hill, if you know, you can jump in. Uh, we've been doing the work for the past nine or ten months, but we, we issued it uh, in its final form on April 2nd of this year. Okay, on April 2nd of this year it was issued, and we're now at June, uh, what is it, the 29th. I note in your uh, testimony, Mr. Hill, that um, we do not yet have a team, nor do we have a team leader. None of those has been appointed. Is that your testimony, Mr. Hill? Uh, that was one of the concerns we had. We, this, this is a problem that we, we feel transcends not only the agency, the way they're, they're currently organized between the headquarters and the, uh, the field structure, but internally with the three areas as they're broken up. Uh, this cannot be accomplished by any one group. It's going to take a joint effort. Um, and uh, what we would like to see is, is that joint effort, not, no, not only in terms of staffing, but in terms of funding. Ms. McDougall, do you dispute the fact that neither the members of the team nor the leader uh, have Yes, been I do. We are using an existing established forest health team that is corporate in nature, crosses functions, and that effort is being led by the Director of Fire and Aviation Management. Do you want to respond to that, Mr. Hill? Mr. Uh, no. uh, Doolittle, the last time we looked, the interdisciplinary team that was going to support uh, state and private forestry in developing that plan was not formed, and the leader has not been designated, and the last time we looked was last week. Thank you. Okay, now I note that... Um, in the testimony from the GAO, 
which says we estimate that the cost of the agency to reduce fuels in the 39 million acres of national forest land, I suppose that's what you were referring to, Mr. Truesdale, uh, when you mentioned the 3 million acre per year figure as the goal, even though the implementation has been about only a third of that. Um, but the 39 million figure comes from that 1995 report, is that right? All right. So this is quoting a report, we estimate the cost of the agency to reduce fuels in the 39 million acres of national forest land in the interior west that are at high risk could be as much as 725 million annually or more than 10 times the current level of funding for reducing fuels. Now I understand that uh, we are not increasing our level of funding in this uh, fiscal year coming up, is that correct? That's correct. And could you tell me why you have decided not to increase the level of funding given this testimony from the GAO? Well, the administration has many priorities, and that's one of them. Well, you're the administration responsible for the forest. Did you request, or did, should I say, did the, did the Forest Service, which you represent, request of the uh, OMB or the administration uh, an increase in the amount of funding? The agency request was, was higher. The agency request was higher. How much higher? Um, 100 million. So the agency requested 100 million more dollars uh, than the administration chose to give it in the, in the final budget. Is that right? It was 100 total, 35 million more. So they asked for 35 million more. Um, and what was it that the administration included in its budget? What was the figure? 65. So they included 65 million. You asked for uh, half again as much, roughly, at 35. And uh, according to this, you'd need uh, 10 times as much in order to meet the goal. <coughs> I just wanted to ask the GAO, and this has been a concern of mine, and Mr. Duncan got right to it in his questioning, pointing out, and, and the, you know, I've been on this committee for eight and a half years, and catastrophic forest fire has been the subject of testimony from the Forest Service and others for every one of those years that I can recall. Back in those years, we were looking at growing four to five times as much board feed of timber annually as we were harvesting. Now, using the figures that Mr. Duncan uh, has used, and I guess the Forest Service, I understand, is, is agreeing to them. It's now more than seven times the amount of board feet of timber that we're growing annually as contrasted with what we're harvesting. So I'd like to ask Mr. Hill and his experts, uh, aren't we uh, vastly, almost geometrically compounding this problem of overgrowth on the forest, even if we went with the goals of the Forest Service, is my understanding, by, what is it, 2015, there'd still be 10 million acres of um, of the 39 that would be untreated. And, and yet we fail to take into account that all of these acres, treated and untreated, are continuing to produce timber. So Mr. Hill, did you take into account this uh, huge mathematical compounding of the problem as you did your report? Well, uh, yes, obviously that was uh, part of our calculations and uh, they, they do seem to be losing ground. Excuse me, Mr. Dula, I would like to clarify one thing. The Forest Service testified today that they feel that they can uh, do substantially less than 39 million acres of fuel reductions and protect the forests. And our report stated that it would take up to $12 billion. And they said it could be less. And we agreed uh, that it could be less. Uh, our point is, if, you, if you're going to spend less, then you have to specify and arrange it in those places you're cutting in a priority to reduce the risk to the remaining, to break it up in some way so that fire can't spread across it. Until they've established, though, that kind of priorities, there's no basis for eliminating any of the acres from the at-risk acres. So well, I think you brought the facts out. I mean, the, the Clinton administration is saying one thing and doing another, uh, and uh, we're we're uh, falling dramatically behind in keeping up with, with the health of our forests. And by the way, there's the implication, Mr. Hill, in your report, that most of this problem is, is basically due to this uh, undergrowth, uh, you know, this, these uh, 
inch uh, in diameter uh, types of things that are growing. And, uh, even in, in Ms. McDougall's testimony, uh, she acknowledges that there is severe overgrowth. I'm trying to find her testimony right here. Um, give me a moment and I will. She says on page two here that many of these stands are dense and overcrowded with high mortality rates due to dark beetle and other insect outbreaks. I can tell you as I fly over my Sierra Nevadas, and I believe your own information backs this up, over one third of the stands is made up of dead and dying trees. I mean, they're obviously from the air brown trees. It's, it's appallingly bad. The forest health is the worst it's ever been in the 20th century. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I would like to clarify or ask you to clarify. You've sort of implied that this is mainly due to this dense undergrowth. What about the standing trees that are dead and dying? Doesn't that, in conjunction with a dense undergrowth and lightning, produce these sorts of catastrophic forest fires that sear the soil for years and that produce these devastating consequences? You're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Doolittle. And well, in then fact, why didn't the, you the put that more related. forcefully in your report? In, in, in point of fact, many of the dead and dying uh, trees occur because the stands are weakened because of excessive undergrowth. It's a succession of problems in which the excessive number of trees compete too much for nutrients and water, and then the trees become susceptible to the bugs, and, and you have a suite of problems. Did you, I'm learn, I'll ask the last question. I'm running over, but I, I have to go, and I want to ask this one question. There was a time in this country up through the 80s when we were able to carry out a decent timber program where we cut live trees, we were able to thin out the forest, they were healthy, they were in great shape, and, and, and things were running correctly. The Clinton administration has succeeded in slowing this down. I think we've now reduced our timber harvest by about four-fifths of what it was in 1990. Did, did you conclude, uh, uh, Mr. Hill or, or your uh, associates, that uh, that uh, reduction in the, in the timber harvest has had some uh, negative impact on forest health? No, I can't say we concluded that. There's a lot of factors that go into the current uh, forest health problem. Um, and, and it's true that you could use a timber program to help uh, in, in uh, uh, solving some of this problem. But, but that would be politically incorrect, wouldn't it? That wouldn't appease Mr. Gore's friends. That, Mr. Doolittle, I will not answer. But I will say that is not the that is not the sole solution to the problem, and I think in I our report I didn't say it was, but is it part of the solution? I understand. Yes, it, it, well, I wish it, you'd it could, say yes. that in your report. It, and I believe we do say in our report that uh, a a small percentage of this problem could be managed through the timber program. Does it concern you that, uh, that that we have to pay people to go in and take out these dead and dying trees, whereas if we got them within a year after they started to be dying, that they would have commercial value and then somebody else could pay for it other than the taxpayer? Well, it, it concerns me the problem that we have, and unfortunately, most of the problem that we currently are dealing with is, is basically non-commercial value uh, uh, materials. Yeah, and how do they get to be non-commercial value? When speaking of trees, the ones I see from the air that are all brown, how do they get to be that way? Well, that may be a question that you want to direct to the Forest Service, Mr. Doolittle. Well, I've, I'd like the GAO to look into that, but I'll direct it to the Forest Service and as to ask you to, to report uh, your, your findings there, perhaps, in, in a written supplemental statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Doolittle. And the Chair recognizes Mr. Gilchrist for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman, uh, John asked all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple more. <laughs> um, could uh, uh, Ms. McDougall, could you tell us when the um, when did the policy of fire suppression in the Forest Service change? What do you mean the policy of fire suppression? Can you clarify that for well, me? I, I guess it used to be for you know in the Park Service and the Forest Service for most of the. Uh, 19th and 20th centuries, there was a policy of suppressing fires. And part of the reason we have buildup of fuel is because of the suppression of fires in our nation's federal land. What, and I don't know the answer to this. Was there a point in time when the Department of the Interior or Department of Agriculture said, 
that the suppression of fire is a bad idea and we have to change that policy. Was there ever a time when that happened? Last 10 years, 20 years? Mr. Truesdale? Yeah, if I may. Uh, I don't think either agency, any of, any of the interior agencies or the Forest Service will ever say that suppressing fires is a bad idea. We still have to suppress most of the fires. We can't allow them to go back to their natural role because of either the condition of the forest or the wildland-urban interface or a whole range of uh, reasons to suppress fires. In 1995, in December of 1995, uh, Secretary for Agriculture and the Interior signed the wildland fire policy, which reaffirmed it wasn't really a change in policy, I don't believe. It reaffirmed the fact that fire suppression is a key part of our management strategy. It reaffirmed the fact that due to aggressive fire suppression over the past 50 years, and the elimination of fire in large areas of the forest, we have resulted in the problem that GAO has just reported about in their, in their report. I, I guess... And that what we need to follow up on is get that reintroduction of fire back into the ecosystem through an aggressive fuels treatment program and through the use of wild natural ignitions and allowing them to burn where how, feasible. How long has it been recognized? It seems to me, I'm not a forester, I live in the state of Maryland and all that, and I'm here with my Western companions. Um, it seems to me, though, um, I lived for a while in a designated wilderness area in northern Idaho in 1986 and 1987. And at that point, the Forest Service recognized that a healthy forest was one when there was a lightning strike, probably didn't burn more than a couple of acres. Uh, right. That the buildup of fuel was damaging to the health of the trees and posed a catastrophic danger for uncontrolled fire. It causes their own weather and a whole range of other things. And that was back in 86 and 87. They were very familiar with that policy. Right. So over the years have, um, and I guess I'll ask this to GAO, and I haven't read your report, um, can you point to, is it, is it the leadership in the, in the Department of Agriculture that didn't say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, so many years ago, that we're having a buildup of fuel, we need to deal with this issue? Uh, was it a lack of resources? Um, can you point to a specific series of problems that caused the situation we now find ourselves in? And do you have some specific recommendations for us to get out of it? Um, I know that's a simplistic question with... Uh, Complicated. Well, it's, it's not simplistic. Actually, what we found uh, for this and other problems, it was that it was a lack of knowledge. And the Forest Service has learned a lot over the last 50 years. And if there's one thing that holds true uh, for federal land management in general is, is the issue of unintended consequences. You do something for one reason, such as putting out fires and suppressing smoke, okay, in, in populated areas and everything. And by doing that, you create another problem that you maybe never thought of or never considered the consequences of when you made that decision. But quite honestly, you can probably end up blaming this whole thing on Smokey Bear. I mean, he's, you know, it was su suppressing fires. Um, and that was the idea but whether they were... that back um, in 1986, uh, it was very clear in my mind, having been in this, living in this wilderness cabin, one of my duties was to look for forest fires. Mm -hmm. Now, they weren't going to be fought, but I was to report any lightning strike or forest fire that I saw and where it was. But it was clear back then from those fellows at Powell Ranger Station um, on Loxa River in the Bitterroot Mountains that suppressing fires caused major problems. Congressman and Gilchrist, first of all, you know how to live. That's a wonderful <laughs> place to be. Uh, I say that as a Marylander. Uh, secondly, however, uh, one of the real difficulties this year is we're running out of decision space. There is a difficulty reconciling the different stewardship requirements to protect watersheds, to produce resources, to protect species, to keep fuels down, and you, we can't let, ne and we've got a lot of people moved into the neighborhood. So as Mr. Truesdale accurately said, fires 
when and how you let a fire burn and when the situation has gotten, has gotten uh, too complex for you to let it burn is a difficult one to make. I think what our report really is, is talking about is the fact that you have to understand those conditions and set priorities that maximize as best you can uh, the situation. You're not going to be able to let everything burn. The reason since 1986 there hasn't been a dash to, the, to, to lighting matches or whatever, letting it burn, is because there are other resources that have to, including air quality, which is better in many places than nature ever, ever put it out there. And we can't, so we, we have to make some choices. I think Forest Service is facing some difficult reconciliation ones. I think our point is that can't be done uh, on the basis of, of uh, ad hoc. It, there has to be a very cohesive strategy that clearly recognizes those priorities and makes it absolutely transparent to everyone what the thinking is that's going into it. And that's the difficulty, and that requires a really cohesive strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gilchrist. The chair recognizes Mr. Peterson for questioning. Uh, I just want to follow up on the discussion that was just here. You just mentioned that the, the reasons we manage is for uh, watershed, air quality, wildlife, and forest. You know, we have, we have all these, you talked like they were competing reasons to manage, or how, or, you know, did you mean that, 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 that these things are competing and, and what's good for they one are difficult isn't good to for reconcile the other? In some, in, they are very difficult sometimes to reconcile because the forests have been changed a lot and, and, and there are 200 million, 250 million people. Well, I, I don't speak knowledgeably from the West. I spent three days in the West touring the forest a couple years ago, so I have limited. Now, I, I grew up in the Eastern Forest. And I understand the hardwood forest, but I don't really understand the softwood forest. But, but, but you know, I, I think you're making it more complicated than it really needs to be. If you have a healthy forest, the rest happens. You'll have watershed protection. You'll have wildlife. You'll have clean air. I mean, you'll, you'll, all the things win when you have a healthy forest. And while we may be managing for these other things, if we, if we, if we allow the forest to become unhealthy, it all falls apart. And I think that's where we're at. We have a, uh, I mean, it, it's not that complicated. It, it is, isn't, Congressman. It, it, is, it is complicated now because we've allowed the forest to become unhealthy. Now the problem is, how do you correct that problem? And that is a complicated answer. It's putting Humpty Dumpty back together. Yes, but, but if you have a dying and whatnot, and I was amazed, I flew over the, the huge burn out there that I guess I, I never had seen anything like that. Uh, it seemed like we flew in choppers for hours before we saw any vegetation that was alive. I mean, it just, it, it appeared to be sterile. And it was right after those uh, huge fires a couple years ago. But, uh, and nothing's worse than that because the devastation there to, there was no wildlife left, there was, there was no environment left. And only the good Lord knows how long it'll take for it to come back. But, but it appears we're, we've, because we've accepted a no-cut policy, that no cutting is some horrible thing, we have allowed a, a process to develop where and, and this is not the case in the East where I come from, but, but I'm told out there that every part of the West has a different amount of stems that will support with waters and nutrients. I mean, so here on this ridge, it may be 60 stems per acre, and this ridge, it may be 40 stems per acre, and we seem to be able to determine that. But if we don't, and then you have a couple wet seasons, and you get a lot of vegetative growth, and then you come back to your normal dry seasons, and, and we stop the fires, and we got the whole nature balance of nature out of sorts because it's immoral and sinful to cut down a tree, we can't fix it. And I, I'm not prescribing this, but I, I saw, uh, I was at a forestry association banquet in, or not, breakfast yesterday in Pennsylvania for the National Association of Foresters. And the uh, ex-state forester, who was a good friend of mine when I was in state government, gave a, rev a review of Pennsylvania's forest and how they were totally destroyed by the people that cut all the hemlock and all the beach for the bark. They didn't even cut it for the wood, they cut it for the bark and totally destroyed Pennsylvania's forest. But the good Lord was good to us. There was a little bit of hardwoods mixed in and when it came back, it, we have a gorgeous hardwood forest and we have very limited beach and very limited hemlock, but we have a, you know, cho air, uh, cherry and oak and maple and all the high quality species and we, you know, good Lord gave us. But just 50 or 60 years ago, that was just a brush pile. I mean, it wasn't much of anything. But, it, you know, in some cases, <laughs> maybe it's to the point of where we're going to have to go in and cut down a dying forest and help a new forest to grow. But, 
it appears like we're in a policy where that's considered evil. We're going to wait till it destroys itself because it's going to have a fuel load that a fire will be uncontrollable once it starts, and when it gets done burning, there's not going to be anything left. And so, I mean, I think somehow we're going to have to have a public discussion about that, and the anti-cut people are going to have to realize it's either cut or burn, and which is worse, because we've let the balance of nature get out of, and, and when it burns, from what I saw, I don't think anything wins. The air certainly didn't win. Wildlife had to be destroyed if it didn't run fast enough. Uh, and, and the water quality had to go to hell in a handbasket. I mean, you know, just, it just had to. There was no winners with a major fire. And I, I just don't think we look at that seriously enough. We're still arguing about do we cut down trees or don't we cut down trees. And if there's 200 trees on an acre and only can support 50, if you don't cut 150 down, you're not going to have any. Now, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but it seems to me we have to get serious about it. Maybe we have to figure out another creative way of how to utilize this waste in some productive way because it appears now we're down to the point where we don't have any value. We have to somehow pay somebody to come in and fix it. And, and we don't have the resources or are not willing to put up the resources to do that. But it, it just seems uh, terrible to me that we end up with what was a wonderful forest in the West uh, slowly being destroyed because of competing policies that can't come together. Any of your thoughts? Mr. Peterson, it, it gets back to that issue of trust. Um, and that's why it's so important for the Forest Service to develop a strategy based on good science that will convince people that harvesting timber is a valuable tool in restoring forest health and that if you're going in to cut commercial timber, you do cut commercial timber, but if you're going in with the purpose, a stewardship purpose to restore forest health, that you only harvest those trees that are, that are critical to getting you to, the, to that desired condition. And that's why um, you really can't have any more false starts. You're going to have to have a good strategy. You're going to have to be convincing in the fact that we're doing it right. And the way you do that is public participation. And if, and if we have continue to have political figures making those decisions that don't know much about science of forestry, we will continue to go down the road we're in, which is the wrong road, in my view. I think politicians have gotten in the way of good science. And political people have spoken and are controlling what we do in the forest today that don't know anything about managing forests. And I think that's the problem we're at and we're willing to face that. I don't, I don't, know, how we, I don't know how we solve the problem. It's thank you, Mr. Peterson. The chair recognizes Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And I want to thank uh, all the members of the panel for uh, their testimony and their comments. Uh, um, Mr. McDougall, I, I just have a few questions. I want to make sure you, you indicated that um, the Forest Service accepts uh, certain aspects of the GAO report and then takes dispute with some other aspects. And I just want to read a couple of things that were in the report, and I would ask you if you agree or disagree with, with those. Uh, the GAO report says that the most extensive and serious problem related to the health of national forests in the interior west is the overaccumulation of vegetation, which has caused an increasing number of large, intense, uncontrollable, and catastrophically destructive fires. According to the Forest Service, 39 million acres on national forests in the interior west are at high risk of catastrophic wildfire. Do you take issue with that uh, statement, or do you agree with that statement? I agree. Um, the, uh, the report goes on to say um, that the increasing number of larger, more intense fires pose grave hazard, grave hazard to human health, safety, uh, property, and infrastructure. Do you agree with that uh, statement? Yes, and that is why we're focusing uh, as a national priority uh, working on the wildland urban interface issue because okay. of that reason. My point is, is that this has been identified as the most intensive and serious problem and that the increasing number of fires pose grave risk to human health and safety and property. Um, because then the report goes on to say that maintaining current funding levels for preparedness, as is now planned, will result in increased risks of injury and loss of life. Do you agree or disagree with Would that? Would you repeat that again? I page, G, uh, page 5 of the GO report says, maintaining the current funding levels for preparedness, as is now planned, will result in increased risks of injury and loss of life. I wouldn't agree with that. I, I don't know that to be true, given the priorities that we're focusing on next fiscal year that are highly identified in our budget. 
I also have take exception with the cost that GAO has identified to fully implement. You've testified to that efforts. already, but, yes. but I want to come back to this. So then what, what you're saying is, is that the current levels of funding are sufficient to protect the property and well-being of the people in the interior west. Is it sufficient or is it Oh, in the interior west. I mean, it's either sufficient or it's insufficient. It's, it's, it's more than just the funding. It's all the other conditions and values that we have to consider. It's not just throwing money at it. Okay. It's having good weather. It's, it's, it's all of the components. It's having public acceptance and valuing all the other things that, that make a difference, but it's not just dollars. So you don't need more dollars or you do need more dollars? I'm trying to find out what the answer is. We can is. use more dollars, I'm asking, yes. I'm asking though if you need them or not. I mean, you asked for $100 million, you got... And we believe we could, we could advance the program with that, yes. Can you do what's necessary to protect the property and the people of the West with the current level of funding of $65 million? That's the question I'm asking. Will $65 million per year be sufficient for you to protect the people and the property? We've identified that it's at risk. Is that enough money or not enough money? Is it what I'm trying to find out? We have testified uh, before this committee, I believe, that by 2005, we will be burning, we would like, our goal is to burn 3 million acres a year. Okay. So or treat 3 million acres a year. Now, and that's, that's, that's the next question I have, and I, and I think, uh, uh, Mr. Joy, I think one of the things that you commented earlier is you said uh, you could blame this whole thing on Smokey the Bear. Uh, that, that's a little bit simplistic, isn't it? I mean, the fact is, is there were catastrophic fires in the West before there was logging in the West and before there was really settlement of the West. Isn't that true? Well, well since I blamed it on Smokey, I'll, I'll, All right, then. I'll, I'll, I'll take the bit. Um, the, the point is there's always been fire in the West. And yes. big fire. Okay. Um, in the past, they were, they were not of a, as intense, as large as they are now because fire swept through those systems far more often. It was less to burn. Uh, would the gentleman yield, please? Certainly yield. Um, I, I'm sure in the gentleman's district, as well as in my district, the ravages from the 1910 fire still exist. And that fire burned across three states and burned so deep into the soil that even today, um, nearly 90 years later, we've not been able to see a natural revegetation occur. And, and even in fact, uh, we can't even plant trees and have them grow there because this, the soil was sterilized to such a vast degree because of the intense heat from the fire back in 1910. And I yield back to the gentleman. I think I think the gentleman. As a matter of fact, I, I mean every, every analysis that I've read, for example, of Yellowstone Park, it's been a site of catastrophic fires at relatively regular intervals over periods of centuries. But uh, the point I was getting at is, is that I think your comment is that we're running out of time, decision time, and the suggestion that we're going to solve all this problem with prescriptive burning is just unrealistic. Isn't that true? Uh, That's Mr. not Trump? our recommendation. Hmm? That's not that is not your recommendation. I, and, and let me clarify, our use of the phrase catastrophic fire, I think, is borrowed from the Forest Service. And we would distinguish, certainly in the 1910 fire, it was a hum, huge fire. Um, that, that happened for a whole host of, of reasons that are, are different than the current conditions. One of the things that makes a fire that is a large fire now, even not as large as the 1910, in some ways, catastrophic is because we've got a lot more people and things in the way. So it's, it's a right. lot of other things that go into the definition of catastrophic. And the intensity of the yeah. fire and how that impacts the soil and watersheds right. and other issues uh, is part of that because of the excessive fuel. And, and danger mm -hmm. of firefighters right. and the whole bit. Which means that we're going to have to use mechanical methods of mimicking fire. I mean, isn't that part of what the solution is going to prescriptive fire may be part of this? Our, our report does indicate that it is going to require all of those, but it's a general consensus that it's clearly going to require mechanical means as well. Mr. McDougall, earlier that you said that um, uh, in response to, I think, Mr. Doolittle's questions with regard to the fact that GAO has pointed out that a team hasn't been appointed and a leader hasn't been appointed to deal with this strategy, and you said, well, actually, you've identified some people within the uh, Forest Service to do that. I just want to contrast this with how the Forest Service has taken up the ro issue of roads. 
I mean, interestingly, the Forest Service has put greater priority on its road management plan than it has on its fire hazard management plan. In fact, that's been identified, I think, in both testimony and reports. But isn't it true that the road issue is going to be part of the fire management issue as well? I mean, isn't this kind of putting the cart before the horse? You mean in terms of access? Yes. Our field leadership hasn't identified that as a problem. Uh, except that you've, uh, you haven't identified the, that as a problem, that you may close roads or reduce access to force that you haven't decided yet how you're going to manage? That has not been a problem in the fire arena. It has not been identified to us as being an issue. Let me ask you one other question, and that is, to what, how far along are you with risk modeling on an individual force ba basis? Have you identified the risks in each force yet? They're doing, the field is doing a validation of the maps right now. But you do have some risk analysis that's done already? We have done some at the national level, and yes, additional work will be done on the ground too. But has there some work been done, some risk modeling work been done? Um, by, in by certain force? areas of the country, but spotted. It's spotted. Is the work that has been done to date available to this committee? Certainly. Okay, so if there are any risk models or maps or any of that material that's been completed to date, uh, you will provide that information to this committee? I'm, I'm trying to be clear on what it is you're expecting. Whatever we risk modeling that's been done on an individual forest basis with regard to risks associated with damage to property or to life or to the resource itself or to habitat or to watershed, any of that work that's been done, any maps that have been done, Okay. That information is available to the committee. Certainly. Thank you. Lastly, if I could have just one more minute, Madam Chairman. Um, um, uh, Mr. Hill, uh, Mr. McDougall says that they don't need more money. You've testified that they need about $725 million a year. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Uh, comment that they don't need any additional money to uh, address the problem of risk to people and property? Is that um, realistic? Well, the only comment I would have is, is, is it, it must be a heck of a strategy they're coming up with because they haven't been able to come near their, their goals with the amount of money they've been spending so far. So with no team, no leader, and a commitment to have this by the end of 1990, you've identified they don't have good risk data now to do this with. Uh, they, the, the fact that they're not going to, the comment that they would be able to do this with the existing budget, does that seem pretty real, unrealistic to you? Uh, yes, sir, it does. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you to all the members of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Hill. The Chair recognizes Mr. Sherrod for uh, questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. This, this has been a very disturbing hour and a half to me. Uh, if, unless I am mistaken, I heard the Forest Service agree with the GAO's report that we have a crisis in our national forests and our forest, forest lands in that we have way too much fuel accumulation so that we do not have a healthy forest. And yet, I then have heard that we don't have too much of a plan or too much money to back the plan up and yet we think we're going to be successful and solve the problem. And as an observer here today, that just doesn't compute to me. I think we have one of the greatest resources that we as a nation have been entrusted with, and it's been managed by the science of the day for a hundred years, and if I'm to believe what I hear today, it's probably in the worst shape it's been in a hundred years. Now, where are we going here, folks? It sounds to me like the Forest Service is carrying the administration's and to some extent, good meaning policies from the environmental communities water instead of doing their job and taking care of our forests. 
Would anyone like to comment? I, I understand your concerns. Um, the issue is real. I would hope that you not leave this hearing thinking that the Forest Service is doing nothing about it. Most of the forests in this country are healthy, but we do have problem areas. And we are doing what we can within the budgets that we're given to address it. This does not mean that we're going to treat every acre or need to, and that's why I had some concerns with the GAO budget estimate. It doesn't mean that, but I don't get to say what it does mean. The field leadership does, and it differs all over the country. <clears throat> well, active work to create a long-standing problem is very difficult, and it's a huge job. But I think, first, we have to get good policies. Now, we don't have in Pennsylvania the huge fire problem that you have in the West because we have more moisture. But we have the same problem with changing forests. You know, they've gone from a coniferous forest to a hardwood forest, and now uh, with gypsy moths and uh, dying oak, they're going back in some respects to a coniferous forest, which will not be nearly as valuable to us. And yet, in the Allegheny National Forest, which is where the highest quality furniture and veneer lumber in the world comes from, we have the Allegheny Forest shut down. There is no harvesting allowed in the Allegheny National Forest. So that forest is becoming over mature. When it becomes over mature, we waste the resource and the private ground surrounding the uh, Allegheny National Forest has so much financial pressure on it that it's being overcut. So unintended consequences, I think, could be the title of this hearing today. But not only unintended consequences of our policies over the last hundred years, but unintended consequences of the policies that we're pursuing today. And it's, I'll stop now, but it's very concerning to me that we don't seem to learn from our mistakes. And if anybody wants to take anything I've said apart, you're welcome. I'd love to hear it. Are there any, are there any comments from the witnesses? No. no. Mr. Sherrod, thank you very much. The chair recognizes Mr. Herger <coughs> for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. McDougall, you just uh, stated, I believe, that uh, you, un I tried to write it down as you stated it, uh, that you understand our concerns. You know, I've been listening to this testimony for the last hour and 35 minutes. And as a member of Congress who represents the uh, northeastern part of California, some all of, or 11, all of or parts of 11 national forests, uh, which is part of this area in the interior west on the map over here, an area by looking at that I would say is probably more than a quarter of the entire United States that not only do you not understand our concerns, Ms. McDougall, I'm convinced you don't have a clue of our concerns. You stated earlier in your testimony that uh, 
that the American, and you said this very emphatically, that the Ameri I wrote this down too when you stated it, that the American people expect action. Is that not what you said? The American, well, I wrote it down. You said very emphatically that the American people expect action. My question to you is, and we've talked about this with the earlier questions, but with the fact that the GAO says that, and I might mention, I'm in an area that has forests that have catastrophic wildfires in them virtually every year. Forests that in many areas are two and three times denser than they were historically, simply because we've eliminated fires over the years, well-meaning uh, uh, Smokey the Bear fires, and now our forests are so dense, two and three times denser in areas, uh, competing for the same amount of moisture in our area, which is prone to droughts. Six of the last 13 years have been droughts. Uh, four of those, five of those have been consecutive droughts. That we have areas that are just a time bomb waiting to happen. Uh, this is not new. It's been this way for all of the uh, almost 13 years that I've been representing that area. Uh, this is not new to the Forest Service. But I, my question is to you, when you say that uh, the American public people expect action, and when you say that you understand our concerns, and yet your plan is only to treat 3 million acres, when the GAO says there's 40 million acres that are in need of being treated, can you tell me how that, how you can say that how you can define that as a definition of action and how you even have the slightest idea of our concerns? The situation and concerns you spoke of are not unique to your quarter of the world, sir. Um, there are a lot of uh, considerations that we have to um, bring into decisions as to how fast we can target this. We have never maintained in any hearing that we're going to treat all 39 million acres, or do we need to? And so I, I, I'm, I'm a little taken aback You feel by that, that three millions of 39 is enough? And I might go on as an additional question is, of that three million, you're only treating one third of that. So you're only doing one third of three million, I would ask you, does this not verge on being criminal? And is there any correlation perhaps that for the first time with the Clinton-Gore administration, uh, the leadership of the Forest Service is now a political appointee where never before it was? Is perhaps it because of the leadership of the extreme environmental community that perhaps pulls strings that only allows you to treat uh, one-tenth or one uh, less than that of what needs to be treated? And how you can sit before us and have the, the audacity to state that you understand our concerns or that the American public expects action and yet you are doing virtually nothing? Could you respond to that, please? Virtually nothing? Again. We have air quality considerations. The target is 3 million acres a year. We never Out of have 40. testified. You're only doing one third of that. We never testified that we were going to do And yet 40. you don't want more money, and that's what the GAO says you need to be able to do it. In other words, you're I going down, not that up. That is true, you're sir. You're getting worse on your results, not better. Please let, please let, please let the congressman complete his question. I'm completed. In other words, you're getting worse, not better. Your results are far worse than they used to be, not better. Again, how can you sit here representing a political appointee and say somehow you understand and that you are working on this or even make any allegation you're doing better? 
not only are you not doing better, you're doing far worse and are basically ignoring completely the problem. Is that a question or a comment, sir? I'm, I'm not clear. Well, it's a statement. I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't mind you attempting. I know it's pretty difficult to respond to it. It's a fact I believe I've stated. I wouldn't mind you responding to it. I think we are moving very aggressively to deal with Very the aggressively. Yes. Three million out of 40, you're only doing one third of that. Uh, you, you, you say that's aggressive. What, what in your opinion would be non-aggressive? If we that's aggressive, moved, what would your definition moved, of not being aggressive be? We have moved in the last five years or so from a little over 300,000 acres to 1.3 million. And so, yes, we do think we are, are getting the job done. You're really moving, aren't you? And we're focusing. We're you focusing. You really are. Yes. That's uh, I don't know how you can sit before this committee and even make the statements that are so outrageous with the facts being what they are. I represent a community, and let me just, a, a district that is burning up, where forest health is, is virtually completely destroyed by the incredible misaction and policies of the federal government and the Clinton-Gore administration and the Forest Service. And I think it's time that the, the, the country be aware of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Herger. The Chair recognizes Mr. Udall. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, panel, for taking your time to be here today. I uh, have a, a large group of questions. I don't think I'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, but I wanted to start out and, and just uh, set the stage for you in regards to my district. I represent the second district in Colorado, which uh, includes a lot of the northern Denver suburbs and Boulder County. And, but then it has two mountain counties, Gilpin and Clear Creek, and we have uh, quite a bit of forest lands there. And in our area, the big issue right now is the urban wildland interface. And uh, I had a, uh, a letter here uh, that I think complements uh, that point of view, and I want to just uh, make a comment about that. Um, in some of our counties, local governments are using zoning and, and uh, fire codes, such as restrictions on building materials and uh, where you can, you can build new homes as tools uh, to reduce the risk of uh, property loss from fire. Uh, does the Forest Service uh, work with local governments along uh, these lines? Yes, we do. And we also, in terms of our research com component of the organization, help develop some of these treatments to, to uh, make more fireproof uh, building materials. Ms. McDougall, I don't know if you've seen uh, a paper uh, that I've been given reporting on. Actually, it's a letter reporting on a paper uh, that's based on some research and uh, suggesting that uh, reducing the ignitability of houses in the interface uh, could be as important as other steps uh, to reduce risk. Are, are you familiar with this uh, paper and would, do you have any comments along those lines? I think I know what you're talking about. I have not seen the, the research paper itself. I just saw an article that referred to it. But Denny, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. I think he's talking about the... You're the Oregonian. Is that the Oregonian article? Well, I have actually now I have two. One is uh, Jack Cohen uh, has uh, done some research, and then I have another report here from John Keeley and uh, Mr. Fotheringham and uh, Marco Moraes as well. And if you could maybe for the record, uh, Madam Chair, submit some comments. Uh, We'd be happy to. In the near future. We have them. Um, thank you for that. Uh, hearkening back to, I think, some questions that Mr. Uh, do little ass. I want to direct these to M Mr. Hill. Um, there was some discussion whether the problem we're talking about is that an, uh, whether it's an, not enough board feeder being removed or not. And is, it strikes me maybe the proper measure uh, is in terms of reducing fire danger. Is it uh, have to do with whether board feet, a certain amount of board feet's being removed, or how many acres we're getting treated? Can you could you speak to that? Well, I think. 
what what we were saying was I mean you've got a problem out here let's just talk the interior west now 39 million acres and I think what you need to do is figure out where those problems are and what are the best techniques or tools for dealing with it uh, in some cases it's mechanical in some cases it's it's uh, controlled burns in some cases it's timber harvesting or clear or, or, uh, thinning or clearing out areas um, uh, and doing it in a way that makes sense and, and part of the problem in developing a strategy is what you're dealing with, what's there on the land. Uh, if there are residential houses uh, that are in the forests or cabins and, and things like that, you may have to use different tools and different techniques. So we can't say that there's a blanket tool that can be used to deal with this entire situation. It's got to be done on, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, and that takes science, that takes data, that takes information. Uh, to, to assess the risk and, and what's present on that land in order to determine what the best technique or tool is to use. So it's, it's still the measurement in many ways comes down to acres treated and in some cases you've got to use certain uh, techniques. Mr. Yudolfo, we, can I add to that? Sure, sure. Um, in fact, we even point out in our report that probably acres treated is not a good measurement All right. of the accomplishment of the program. In the fact that it costs far more per acre to treat at the urban interface area, which is your concern, okay, with the concern of your constituents, than it does to treat out in, in the all green forests, okay, and everything where you could accomplish a whole lot more in the number of acres treated for the same amount of money that you would treat far less acres at the urban interface. Because you're gonna have to, you can't let it burn there, you're gonna have to go in, you're gonna have to do mechanical, and we use that word, you're gonna have to go in and cut trees. Uh, Mr. Yudol, uh, our report also points out um, you know, that, that because they've used the acres treated, when the money comes down to the Forest Service, you understand the incentive is to do the cheap stuff first, and that's what has been documented, and I think a number of mm -hmm. places said they're running out of the cheap places. So that's a particularly, what, what is needed is an understanding on a landscape level and, a, and a, at, at different levels, what is the nature of the threat what is the nature of the hazard? And we're talking about hazard reduction as opposed to, uh, as opposed to simply acres cut or board feet. So part of what your report was speaking to is looking at this whole issue of incentives and absolutely. Uh, and I, I, we I, ought to look our, at our, our report recommends that as a step in the agency strategy is that the is that they identify the nature uh, how to overcome that particular problem. In my district, a lot of the, the issue is not so much about uh, uh, timber that's standing, but it's all the brush uh, that's in place. And I uh, don't know whether in, I haven't read your report in great detail, but do you get to the issue of how much of these areas are a problem potentially because of brush and understory as opposed to areas where you have mature timber? I don't think we get to that detail. We do address it, the fact that you have really multi-level structuring in, in there that shouldn't be there. And it's different in different places. Some of it is going to be, especially where you've got mixed conifer coming up underneath, say, oh, ponderosa pine. It's probably be, that stuff that there's no reason why it, it shouldn't be there. It's going to cause a fire risk, and it has commercial value. There's an awful lot that does not, a vast amount that does not. And so we're, we're going to have to look at how we use fiber. Madam Chair, if I might ask just one last question. I think of Ms. McDougall. I, we talk about the 39 million acres. Uh, we talk, the GAO talks about more resources uh, directed your way. My sense, if the Forest Service receives some more of these resources, you could tackle the, some of these other areas. But the question is, of uh, the 39 million acres, how, do you, how are you prioritizing what are those, acre, those uh, areas we, you're going to We treat? don't at the national level, you know, it's a bottom-up kind of thing. What we hope that we will have developed by the end of the year is a strategy by which the field leadership can frame priorities. And, um, but, but they are the ones who are going to do it. So you really honor that Forest Service tradition of local control and local input and involvement? Within a context. Within the overall yeah. context. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can we submit some questions for the record? Certainly. We would welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Udall. Um, I just want to close with a question to Mr. Truesdale. I understand that the Forest Service is embarking on an accelerated fuels reduction program in eastern Oregon. I was very pleased to hear about this, and I was wondering if you would mind, uh, for the record, giving us some more details on that. Uh, we're looking at uh, 
accelerating as many areas as we can. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the uh, idea of consolidating projects, doing large-scale areas would, is very useful, and we've started to emphasize that uh, with, uh, with the field. As far as the, any specifics for uh, the Eastern Oregon project, uh, I didn't come prepared to do that, but I would be happy to send it to you. I don't have the information at hand. We talked to some of the staff, and I don't remember if your staff was there. I believe we got some information to your staff yesterday. We will try to follow up uh, with a formal package uh, right after the hearing. I will do that for you. I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to mention that back in 1988, there was a plan uh, issued by the Forest Service uh, entitled Forest Health through Silviculture and Integrated P Pest Management Control, a strategic plan. That, that plan itself in 1988, although it's common knowledge that once the pests attack a forest, then uh, it, 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 in its wake, uh, that attack leaves uh, that forest more vulnerable to catastrophic fire. Uh, it didn't deal with uh, fire control then. And in, in 1994, the Forest Service issued a report, the Western Forest Health Initiative Strategic Plan, which uh, did deal with the growing risk of catastrophic fire. We are now five years later, and we haven't moved from uh, this point one. We are still dealing with uh, things in the office, uh, with the exception of the uh, approximate 1 million acres out of four, 40 million acres, or 39 million acres, 1 39th of the, of the problem has been dealt with. And the problem is catastrophic in nature. So that is setting aside uh, the normal management that should occur in a, in a forest that keeps the forest healthy. On the average, while a healthy forest, it is agreed, would contain 40 trees per acre, we are now in a situation where the per acre load is 400 trees per acre. So, you know, this country was built on the fact that people could see the problem and put the shoulder to the wheel and put the and and grease the elbows and uh, and start working in the field and that's what we need, Miss McDougall. I am aware of the fact that you went through some pretty intense questioning today, and um, I, I know that the members are very sincerely concerned because we live and work and in areas in our district that are facing these catastrophic collapses in our national forest and hence with our communities. It is a very alarming uh, situation. And uh, you have been in this position or in this department ever since I arrived at the Congress. And uh, whether it's from bottom up or top down, I don't know. Because the bottom up blames the top down. And somehow we're not getting the work done. Um, when, we, when we deal with only 1 million acres out of 39 million acres, of catastrophic a a acres uh, that, that could be um, vulnerable to catastrophic fire and likely will be. We are ignoring a trust that the American people placed in us to take care of their asset and their resources to even suggest that dealing with one or two million acres is what we're going to do and that's it. You know, the, the rest of the American people as well as this panel um, this subcommittee is saying to this administration, but what about the other 39 million acres that will collapse and will be destroyed without attention? Um, so that's the point that Mr. Hill made in his report, that to render the necessary attention, you must ask for the necessary resources because we are at a state uh, of near collapse in at least 39 million acres of our forest, and that is growing e exponentially. My concern is that we are dealing uh, almost with a single focus, realize, not realizing that there is a chain of, of um, concepts that must work together. In order to have good forest health, we need to harvest it like 
and, and prune it like we would our own gardens. Uh, without good forest health, we lose wildlife habitat, and then we lose um, soil stability, and then we lose the clean water. We lose watershed stability, and our natural resources are the total losers, and the American people are the total losers because we're focusing strictly on clean water, ignoring the fact we're losing wildlife habitat, ignoring the fact that, that we are losing that dynamic uh, and that balance in a good, uh, growing and healthy forest. So my plea to you is that the Forest Service once again look at the whole picture and not look at just one link in the chain. Um, and that you look at the entire 39 million acres that is growing year by year and not look at just one million acres or two million acres. I realize that this has been a tough hearing. Um, it was tough for me to read Mr. Hill's report, and I know it's equally as tough on you, Ms. McDougall. But I would like a commitment from the Forest Service that we not just focus on clean water or just focus on the aesthetics. We are big enough to get our minds around this problem and then put the shoulder to the wheel uh, and, and get the labor out there in the field to, uh, to begin uh, that necessary road back to forest health. Ms. McDougall, Ms. McDougall I'd like to offer you a, a final statement or comment, should you wish. I don't think it would be very difficult at all for us to, um, as you say, or I think you said, be more comprehensive in, in what we're doing. And we're doing that in a number of ways. And I hope the next time that I'm before you, we can, we can talk about all the progress we've made on this strategy. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. I look forward to your new report. Mr. Hill, do you have any <coughs> final comments? Well, I, I, we share this, the, the concerns that uh, all the members shared today. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a need for urgency, I think, in dealing with this problem. And unfortunately, um, the Forest Service has been kind of studying it and restudying it for a number of years, and the problem continues to get worse. I mean, we would hope that uh, they aggressively this time develop the strategy, implement it, see it through, hold, hold the managers at all levels of the organization accountable for getting the job done. And what we'd like to see, I think, are maybe some defined performance measures and time frames laid out so it's easier to hold people accountable for getting this task done. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And I would go one step further. I am anxious to see um, the labor in the field. So I want to thank the witnesses again for your fine testimony, all of you. And um, uh, we will welcome the questions from the minority. And we will also be su uh, submitting ad additional questions. My thanks to the GAO for their good work on this report. And uh, should you wish to amend or add to your testimony, you have 10 working days in order to do so. Again, thank you very much. And thank this, you, hearing, Madam Chairman. this hearing is adjourned. and Senate leaders on the National Missile Defense Act. After that, President Clinton announces his Medicare proposal, followed by congressional reaction. Live